Whose land is this? My land. Killers of the Flower Moon is the newest film from filmmaker juggernaut Martin Scorsese, who has in his career stretching over 60 years already proven his skill in creating amazing feats of powerful and ambitious storytelling in films including, but not limited to, Taxi Driver, You talking to me? Goodfellas, The Wolf of Wall Street, and more recently The Irishman. Now we have Killers of the Flower Moon and the reviews are in, and they have been largely stellar. And after watching it and percolating my thoughts for a bit, I would say I agree with them, mostly, but there are still some aspects of the film that let me down. Let me explain. But first, well hello there. This is Zurich and right now we're up in the air where we free fall into books, poetry and anything else we decide to get into. Today we're going to the movies so get a drink, get some overpriced popcorn and Twizzlers, sit back, relax and now that we're all acquainted, let's make our descent. Geronimo. In the same serious crime drama based on a true story vein as Scorsese's previous works Casino and The Gangs of New York, Killers of the Flower Moon is a western crime drama based on the very real Oklahoma murders in the Osage Nation, a Native American tribe during the 1920s, committed after oil was discovered on their land. It also tells the story of the newly created Bureau of Investigation, the agency that would become the FBI, and their investigation of the case. More centrally though, the film is about the relationship between Ernest Burkhart, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, a white man who has just come back from World War One, and his wife Molly Burkhart, played by Lily Gladstone, a member of the Osage Nation, an heir to a very sizable income from the Osage oil. The main source of dramatic tension is coming from the conflict of allegiance Ernest has between his wife and his uncle William Hale, played by Robert De Niro, supposed benefactor of the Osage tribe, though this turns out not really to be the case. Not to mention Ernest's very real love of money. I do love that money, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Overall, it is a fantastic piece of serious cinema championing realism with all its grittiness and moral ambiguity as its core value. Not to say there aren't any funny moments. There are, especially between William Hale and bumbling Ernest, whose lack of intelligence is almost maddening and is often used to comedic effect. The true tale it is trying to tell, that is, of the 1920s Osage murders, is factually very expansive and a fair amount of the first and second act of the film are used to carefully, sensitively and faithfully evoke the atmosphere of the era and the interweaving motivations of the characters. Countering this richly detailed evocation of the era is the plot involving the newly minted Bureau of Investigation. I can't deny this plot development is a welcome change of pace and provides a fast-paced energetic third act as you might expect from Scorsese. The set design is amazing, <laughs> invoking Oklahoma in the 1920s without any fault and the costume design is meticulous, faithfully showing among other things men's suits of the time and those amazing Osage blankets the women wear. The cinematography is a masterwork used effortlessly to emphasise the film's themes. For example, the movie opens on a great wide overhead shot that shows the vastness of the Oklahoma prairies and communicates to the audience in this moment, this story you're about to watch is like these large green fields, expansive, sweeping. I have to say though, the greatest feat of the movie has to be the acting. Leo DiCaprio plays his part perfectly, with his characterization of an unintelligent man who is decidedly opportunistic rather than ambitious and too naive and manipulatable to be opportunistic and so too opportunistic for his own good. My only gripe might be the sheer amount of cotton stuffed in Leo's mouth that makes his lips stick out so much and it might be for his character but it was almost distracting. Um, Robert De Niro really sells the part of the genteel devil, sweet on the outside but merciless on the in. However, the true standout, and I think most critics agree on this, is Lily Gladstone in her depiction of Molly. The passion she shows under a really cool exterior reveals a strong woman trying to do the best for her family but finds herself vulnerable to those closest to her heart and making decisions that she half knows is not a good choice. These characterizations which are superbly human are translated perfectly by Gladstone. In fact, the sheer strength of her acting is involved in one of
one of my reasons why the film let me down in certain ways, which I'll get on to. Before that, I think it would be amiss to not mention my favourite aspect of the film. Where I found the most joy in the narrative is in the story told between Ernest and Molly, their complex relationship rendered with just so much skill. The final scene, for example, between them is one of the most poignant moments of the film, and it really plays to the strength of the movie, which, as expansive and epic the story is, at its heart, a very interior movie of love, heartbreak, and the yearning for a different reality which don't quite align with each other. I mean, <laughs> Molly doesn't want to be killed for her money and Ernest wants to, I suppose that's the difference. <laughs> Overall, the slow simmering tension in their relationship can be boiled down to what will win, love or the love of money. In true Scorsese fashion, the answer is surprising and thought provoking. Also, throughout the length of the movie, the audience is left wondering if Ernest is just truly a fool or if his unintelligence is malicious, which is funny enough, a thought I used to have when I was teaching 12 teenagers on a Monday morning. This is a true testament to the nuance in the script and in Leo's acting. So I just spent the last few minutes describing in detail why I think the film is fantastic. So why did it let me down? Well, there's no denying the movie is a lot and in different ways it's a lot. It's a lot in terms of time with a runtime of three hours and 26 minutes which makes it a prime target in recent criticisms that movies are getting too long or that movies should again have an intermission. And I do think a solid amount of the middle act could have been just tightened up a little and the movie wouldn't have changed that much in terms of quality. Did I need to go to the restroom in the middle of the film? No, but I didn't drink a lot of water, so that's as far as I can go with this scientific inquiry. Other users may vary. The cast is wide, and so there are a lot of characters that I, to be honest, simply struggle to remember. And it also tries to do a lot, plot-wise. One of my biggest problems is that it might be argued that it stretches itself a little thin in terms of its multiple plot focuses. The film focuses on the Osage tribe murders, the Western-esque police procedural of the Bureau of Investigations, the relationship relationship between Ernest and Molly and the deviances done by Ernest and William Hale. I think it's just a bit much and the audience member might struggle to separate these different focuses in their head and be able to consider them without getting muddled when watching the film. I found myself comparing the epic scale of this film with Oppenheimer. The difference being Oppenheimer uses some very clear stylistic choices to separate the different time periods and centres of action in Oppenheimer's life and in the film narrative. But since Killers of the Flower Moon is largely committed to its realism, it is practically limited in what it can do to separate the focus between all these plots. I just think perhaps they could have had less focus on all of these plots because there's a lot of focus on all of them and I feel like they could have been separated out. My biggest gripe though, and perhaps my biggest letdown in this film, is that I think the film should have focused more on Molly and the Osage Nation in general. For a film about Osage murders, the Osage people were slightly less involved in the important parts of the narrative than I was expecting or wanted, to be honest. Overall, I think the movie tried to do a lot of things, and it did a lot of those things wonderfully, but the film's focus was perhaps too expansive, and more importantly, didn't give enough focus to where I think they should have put it. The Osage Nation and Molly Burkhart, both perspectives which I think could have been utilised to a further degree. Nevertheless, I do think this is a fantastic film that is largely deserving of the hype it's getting. So is it perfect? No. Is it worth watching? Oh, without a doubt. Talking to me? You talking to me?